Hi, everybody. How are you doing? Awesome. Thank you all for coming. It really is an honor to introduce Madili Okuwambao. Um, she is an urban planner and professor of African architecture and urban design. She attended the University of Tennessee and Georgia State University, where she pursued her undergraduate studies in architecture and urban planning. She also holds a master's degree in African studies from Clark Atlanta University, where her research is centered on the evolution of modern vernacular architecture in Nigeria. In 2013, she founded Community Planning and Design Initiative Africa, also known as CPDI Africa, which is a research-based culture-inspired culture initiative created to develop a new architectural language for Africa through design competition. Her career as a built environment professional spans over 20 years. So if you'll help me in welcoming her, she can go ahead and take it away. All right, thank you. Thank you so much, Ashley, Nicole, Daniel. Um, thank you, of course, to the school, the department, College of Environmental Design at UGA, Dr. Hurt, Faculty and students, it's definitely a pleasure to be here today with you all uh, to share our story, our journey in this scholarship, in this pedagogy. So what I'll do is I'll pull up my screen and then kind of jump right in because I always have so much to share and I want to be mindful of time. All right. <clears throat> Okay, All right, so if everything is on the screen now, um, and let's get into it. All right, so today um, our lecture's title is Cultural Landscapes and the Role of African Design Philosophy in the Built Environment. My name, as Ashley said, is Madeli Okumabwa, and I am the founder and director of CPDI Africa. And yes, that does stand for the Community Planning Design uh, Initiative Africa. Um, our lecture's content for today, we'll start off with talking about my heritage and then we'll talk about the catalyst. Um, we'll talk about how CPD Africa was formed and then we'll jump into our cultural landscapes. And that means quite a lot to most of us um, that are on the call today. Um, uh, the content focuses on so much. So there'll be quite a bit for students and faculty um, in African studies, engineering, urban planning, landscape design, historic preservation. Of course, all of these are programs that are there at UGA in all of the allied professions that have to do with the built environment. So there'll be something to take away um, by everyone. My heritage, my parents, both ancestors now, um, are from two parts of the world. Uh, my father, Chief GC Okumabwa is from Nigeria. And if you can see on the screen here, Nigeria is located in the Western arm of, of West Africa, right, of Africa. He is Igbo by his cultural identity. He traveled to the US in the 60s to get his education, met my mom who hails from Memphis, Tennessee, um, and they got married and had children. And because my father is the first son, it's always required for first sons to kind of move back home and take care of the general family. So my parents relocated uh, back to Nigeria in 1974. Um, and that gave me the opportunity to grow up in Africa. I talk about my heritage because it's important to understand where I come from, the lens that I use to look at everything, uh, life, um, my identity, and of course, my profession. Um, I have always, loved architecture. It was when I moved to the US as a teenager um, in the 80s that I learned when in high school that this thing I love doing, this thing where I would draw houses and trees and people walking around in, in neighborhoods, this thing was called architecture, it was called design. And so I had a chance to major 
and architecture. I loved it. Um, and um, went on, of course, to undergraduate, uh, to uh, do my studies in architecture. And everything um, had double meanings for me. But we'll talk about how those double meanings um, strengthened because of my cultural background. This image here of my parents truly does show uh, the, reunite, the uniting of Africa and her diaspora. What cultures are created or what culture is created when Africa connects back to its diaspora. So my passion, it had to do with everything that included the built environment. I took classes in architecture, planning, of course, landscape design, um, interiors, real estate, everything. But while I was in school, I never really learned about Africa's contribution to the built environment. What was that? Um, I attended a lecture at a NOMAS conference in 94. And NOMAS is the National Organization of Minority Architects. I met a professor there, Professor David Hughes, and he was speaking about Afrocentric architecture. And it really made me think, what is architecture of the people of the continent of Africa, right? How is that different? What does that look like? As a built environment professional, how could I include my culture's voice? So what was Africa's contribution to the global discourse of the built environment? That became my challenge. I wanted to know what that was. So for example, um, I love this image. I have to give credit. It was found on the internet. So who owns this? I always thank you because I use this image all the time. Is this what the architecture of Africa would look like today if she had continued to develop in her own image? Are these landscapes true? Um, the images that we see here, we're looking at architecture, drawing inspiration from Dogon masks, uh, the Dogon of West Africa, Zulu shields, Zulus of South Africa, anywhere in Africa, actually, the shields, the Sphinx, the pyramids. Are these the aesthetics? Is this, are these the images that of designers, that of designers on the continent would use today to create their spaces? Um, would they create these kinds of architectural or cultural landscapes? Many say that they would not have to go up high because Africa is so large, you could go horizontally, right? There's space, why do we need to do skyscrapers? But could this be an image of a continent? Well, how about this image? This one is by Jaris, a game designer who lives in Canada, originally from the Congo. He would use inspirations from his culture uh, from the Congo to make the backdrops of those games that we play, the video games that we play. And I thought, okay, this might be close to what I would imagine um, for an African architectural landscape. The masks, dead giveaways, immediately tell you this might be a space inhabited by Africans because we know that artifact, that cultural art, the mask, and what it embodies for the people of Africa. The patterns, the motifs, triangles, those shapes, um, earth, wind, fire, water, sky. Um, does this evoke a sense of African architecture, an African cultural landscape, you could say? So along my journey in the um, desire to respond to what I learned in Professor Hughes' lecture that day in 1994 was to come up with CPDI Africa. And CPD Africa would be the response to his lecture. And that is, how could I get everybody else in the community around me to engage in a conversation of what African architecture would be? Because many had said while I was in school that Africans really hadn't contributed anything to the global discourse that uh, what Africans have is maybe huts with thatch roofs. Um, but when it comes to contemporary architecture or the landscape built environment, what Africans do is copy and paste other people's cultural languages as their own. And so what I said what I would do was to come up with an idea that will invite everyone to the table 
and we'll see if we could challenge that notion. If Africa has not created any architecture, then let's create it. And I decided to do it through competition. So CPDI was birthed, and this is what it stood for. Um, it was a cultural inspired research-based design build initiative created to inspire the development of African-centered design languages for Africa and the, the diaspora that are culturally and environmentally sustainable, right? So from this platform, what I decided to do was to create these international competitions. I would open it up. Everyone, anyone, any designer, whatever your background is, architecture, planning, landscape, interior design, right? History, construction, join me, take a traditional vernacular language from any culture in Africa, take that language and fast track it, modernize it, right? Bring it into today's contemporary world and let's see what kinds of prototypes you can come up with, right? So maybe take an image like we see on the right and come up with something new and different like what we see on the left, right? Let's see what kinds of languages we can. It's a conscious e effort to fast track the evolution of Africa's architecture and built environment. Luckily for me, the internet existed. So these flyers went out and lo and behold, people began to respond. We got work from all over the world. We'll see that a little bit later in the presentation. But in order for designers and architects and planners to respond properly, to the design brief, which was the challenge, right? If you're gonna send me something contemporary as African, but you weren't learning this in school because the curriculums were not Afrocentric, right? Um, it meant I would have to do a lot of teaching. I would have to lay the foundation in order for the students to know where to start so that they could create prototypes that were true. I wanna use the word authentic so that they could actually win the money that I was given away in those prizes. And I can actually talk about their work and, and publish them and promote them and celebrate them for being architects that um, kind of invented this modern African architectural languages. So a lot of teaching had to happen. But the first thing I had to do was to get them to understand the scope and the scale of the continent, right? Hopefully many of you all have seen this image before, this map showing Africa and how vast, right? Um, you can fit the United States and China and India and Europe back into the continent and still have space, right? So this begins to give you an idea of the scale. Where are we talking about? When you say Africa, people think, oh, it's one country or they think it's a, a couple of tribes. And that's a horrible word to use. Of these small people, you know, scattered around in some bushes. No, very large continent. But this map here is the one that I love to show because it really begins to put things in perspective. The map on the left shows the 54 African countries today as um, created after um, Europe divided uh, the continent and I think it was 1884 or so, right? So 54 African nations with their European identities, whether you were colonized by the British or the French or the Germans, et cetera, right? Um, new cultures, new language, new borders. But the map on the right is Africa in fact. That's the continent really as is. Those red lines that are superimposed are these country lines, right? After colonization. But the black lines show the true identities of the cultures, the true nations of Africa. And there are thousands of them. So for example, <clears throat> excuse me, looking at Nigeria again in the elbow of West Africa, you can see that collection of black lines. Nigeria has a population of over 200 million people. Uh, there are about 250 ethnic groups. We call them ethnic groups, that, but they're actually countries. You have almost 200 countries in the country of Nigeria. They're all speaking different languages. They all have different fashion, cuisine, spiritual practices, and of course, architecture. So you can actually stand in one spot in Nigeria and take a, a walk in a mile in one direction or a couple of miles and, and the whole cultural scene changes. And you come back and you go a few degrees 
off in another direction and everything changes again. And so when you're talking about creating African architectural languages, it's not just one, it will be a plethora of them. Huge challenge, some people say, but to me, how exciting for designers to sit up and come up with, again, new ways of interpreting the cultures of the people of Africa, right? Into these new languages, um, powerful languages. Again, I said earlier to use the word tribe quite negative because just one group of people in Nigeria, I will take example, the Yorubas, uh, the population is about 60 million. And what's the population of France? It's about 60 million. Again, giving you the idea, right? Or the understanding of the magnitude, the wealth, the richness of each of these groups. And um, what an exciting opportunity to take anything from Africa and make it contemporary. We already know, of course, about the music and the dance and the fashion that comes from the continent, but there's so much more, right? What about its built environment, its architectural languages? But not only uh, would we talk about design languages for Africans in Africa, how about those in the diaspora, those who were taken off the continent four to 500 years ago, uh, taken brought to the Americas to build America, even slave trades that were taking place a thousand years ago on the Eastern coast of the continent, taking Africans over to Arabia and Asia, right? Africans settled in the millions. There are over hundred million uh, Africans in Brazil alone. It's about 45 million black Americans, right? So, so you look at those numbers, what were the new cultures that they created in these spaces and the new lands that they, that they call home? Um, we know again about their music and their food, all of those Africanisms that we are familiar with, the rhythms, the drums. Again, what about the architecture? What about the built environment? Okay. So in order to get that clear understanding, I'll always go back to clarity. Let's define architecture. It's the art and science of constructing a building, but the extended version says, or definition says, it's the reflection of the culture, the lifestyle, aesthetics, local building materials, climate, geography, political and economic purchasing power of a people and a place. It is all of these things translated into their built environment to create their architecture. So that means you should be able to go around the world region by region and the landscape change, right? Their relationship to buildings, to the earth, to nature, transportation, everything would change based on these things, right? This is a translation of their culture into the built environment. So for example, you see this image of a space, you immediately know this could be Chinatown. Chinatown ain't anywhere in the world. It may not be in China, <laughs> but there are spaces that have, of course look like this, right? But what we're looking at here is their aesthetics translated into the built environment. Um, their roof lines, we know this, the language, the, the, the written language on their signboards, the colors, and it's not just on the surface. Once we go into those doors, what's the, fun the functionality of the spaces behind there? You know, do they sit at the dining table and eat or do they eat on the floor? Is it more community? Is it more private? driven, right? private spaces driven, right? So it's all about the people and what they create and present in their built environment. Or how about this space, the Museum of the Future in Dubai? When we talked about um, the wealth, right? Wealth, um, the people's spending power, purchasing power, their technology, power. How is all of this translated into, built, into the built environment? In this image here, the Museum of the Future, the architect has placed this, this structure on an earthen mound, which he has attached spirituality to it. Also very important. The building he says translates the people, their technology and that void in the middle he says is for the future. So how do we read our ideologies into the built environment? All right, this mound here, I love the fact that he said it was, it represented earth and spirituality. All right, so we can look more at that. So having an understanding of what architecture is and what cultural architecture could be, what about African architecture? 
So at CPDI Africa, remember, we're teaching, again, all of this, I'm pulling this together so that the architects around the world can respond properly to our challenge to create modern design languages. I came up with what I call the CPDI Five Pillars of African-Centered Architecture. Culture, aesthetics, spirituality, local materials, and community engagement. If we put on these lens and look at the built environment from an African perspective, it will begin to change. If you put on these same lens and you look from a German perspective or a French or an American, it should change, right? Because it is all of these things translated and they're unique to region based on culture and identity, all right? So what I wanna do now is take them one at a time so you see exactly what I'm talking about, okay? It becomes really clear. Let's take culture. I'll give you one example of culture. These are floor plans, floor plans that we see anywhere in traditional Africa. A cultural element could be defined by, let's say, family. If your family is defined by monogamy, that is one man, one wife, you can imagine a small house, a um, couple of rooms for the children, a master bedroom maybe for mom and dad because the culture here is monogamy. If it's polygamy, which means a husband and many wives and many children, and then the extended definition of family in Africa includes grandmoms and granddads, cousins, uncles, even best friends. You can imagine the size of the floor plan for a house. So the architects responded to these massive family definitions, right, definition of culture, by creating spaces like we see here, many rooms, individual rooms scattered around courtyards. The courtyards were the living rooms. They were open to the sky, right? Because of the great weather, great um, natural landscape, being outside was actually um, like being on the inside. The inside-outside relationship was, was quite close. So you had all of these rooms scattered around courtyards. And the rooms were so that everybody could have their privacy, especially the husband and his many wives. You can't imagine a man with 10 wives in one master bedroom. That's a war zone. So the man gets his room and each wife gets her rooms. And then the boys and the girls get their separate rooms and grandma and, and all. So you can see how the architects responded to this cultural definition of family in their architecture. All right. So imagine now if you're going to still pr pr um, practice polygamy, what that could look like contemporarily. Maybe you wouldn't have a compound. You might have one wife in one part of town, another wife in another part of town. And you can see how that impacts costs, your wealth, how you can afford such. But that's one example of culture and architecture. Our second element was aesthetics, right? Like I said, aesthetics may not be the most important element of, of anything, but it's important because it's the first thing you see, right? What you see tells you a story. So I'm teaching, where, do you, where could you also draw inspiration for your design? Oh my, that must be African inspired. So you would have to draw inspiration from cultural elements in the African space. So here we're looking at the ECOWAS building by Pierre Gudiabe Atepa. The ECOWAS building is um, in Lome, Togo. It's where the West African heads of state um, meet to have their meetings. And he drew inspiration from these Ghanaian stools and Egyptian headrests. Oh my goodness, my pet is barking. Um, one moment while, while I get him to be quiet. One second. Give it. Okay, so we're back. Sorry, that will be quiet now. So Pierre at uh, Gudiabe draws inspiration from these Ghanaian stools and Egyptian headrests. They are seats of power, right? The king sits on the stool, and the pharaohs use these headrests as pillows. So he's taking the power attached to these seats of power and translating that into his building, which is a seat of power, right? Where the West African heads of states meet. So this is an aesthetic inspiration, right? What artifacts can you take from your community 
and create an identity in the built environment that identifies it immediately. If I knew what an, a, a Ghanaian, head, uh, Ghanaian stool looked like, or an Egyptian headrest, and I saw a building like this, I could probably put two and two together, especially if this was common practice. Community engagement. Typically in Africa, people did not pay professionals uh, typically to build. Communities were built by the people. Um, it was sweat equity. Everybody came together to mold the blocks. They harnessed materials from the very site. This is the mosque in Jenny, it's the largest um, earthen structure um, in the world. And it is maintained annually by the people, right? So after the rain falls, the clay walls have to be maintained to be replastered every year. And so everybody will come together, men, women, and children. And it was a big celebration. It was people using their own hands, having true ownership in their community. They built their houses this way, their shrines, their palaces, whatever buildings they made, they made them together. Everyone was an architect, everyone was a builder. Everyone knew the floor plans that worked in their culture, in their community. Okay, so this was a very important element. And I could talk about uh, maybe Habitat for Humanity. Many of you know Millet Fuller. He was in the Congo in the 40s and saw a Congolese family building a home. And he comes back and he brings that concept back to the US. And what is Habitat? It's people coming together, donated materials, sweat equity, and the people building housing for themselves. Of course, at a discounted rate in Africa to be free because we're not getting donated materials, we're harvesting them from site. The next element is spirituality. And I wanna talk about this a little bit in detail because this has to do with landscape and Africa's um, relationship with earth. Another image that I got from the internet, uh, shout out to the owner. Um, Many of you hopefully know what animism is, and that is like the basis of traditional African spiritual, spiritual practices. The belief that everything that God made or everything on the earth has a soul, whether you're human, whether you're an animal, you're a rock, you're a tree, the river, the wind, everything has a soul. Um, before I pluck a, a, a leaf that can cure malaria, I will ask that leaf, can I have permission to take your life to cure another? Um, man's relationship with nature was very powerful. Um, it was revered. Mother Earth was a goddess. We all come from the earth and we go back to the earth. Uh, many people's origin stories have to do with special situations like in Ghana. There's a, a culture in Ghana that their ancestors came up from holes within a sacred forest. And those ancestors came up and they created mankind. So the relationship with earth um, is very spiritual, okay? Um, we know our, our story of Adam and Eve, but here, um, how do Africans relate to their built environment, okay? So that relationship um, uh, of preserving it, there, there is no decision that you take to to suffocate the earth, like how um, you know, pouring concrete or tar to make roads or making buildings out of materials that heat up the planet. Um, Africans wouldn't take that approach, especially traditionally, because of their uh, reverence for the earth. Uh, Mother Earth was, was everything. So let me take that into the built environment. Okay, this is an image of my grandfather's house in my hometown of Iseluku in Delta State in Nigeria. It's special for many reasons. Um, I talk about the fact that my grandfather had three wives. Uh, he, this, he designed this modern house um, and put everybody under one roof, <laughs> but every grandmother still had her own room and he had his. So he did keep with that cultural element. But the other thing that's really important about this house is its spiritual elements. In my community, we believe that the, the, the circle of life is never broken. At any point, we are at one point either coming to the planet, so we are here, all of us on this call, or you're on your way out, like my parents who have become ancestors, or you're coming back in. 
through the through the body of a child, a baby, right? So at any moment you're on that cycle, and my community and many African communities feel that it is very important then to keep the bodies of their ancestors close by. As a matter of fact, keep them in the house. So in Isenuku, we bury our loved one at home, in the house with us. In this home, my grandfather is buried in the living room and my great grandfather is buried in the dining room. Every house is a living mausoleum. Wives have their houses. Remember traditionally on that floor plan when everybody has their own room? Okay, wives have their own houses or their own rooms and they're buried there. And so it becomes part of life to sit at the dining table or the, the living room and continue to communicate with mom or dad because they're right there. Uh, many of you know um, probably uh, the African-American um, cultural uh, practice of pouring libations. Well, that is an Africanism that made it over here to the quote unquote new world with African people uh, 500 years ago. Pouring libation is pouring drink or food in, in, in remembrance of your ancestors, a family member or a friend who has fallen. Typically when that water is poured, it's poured in Africa, it's poured in the house because somebody's actually right there under those tiles, right? But here we don't bury our people in, <laughs> in the house. So we may pour these libations outside or might even pour them into a potted plant. And so I could say, if this practice were to be done here in the US, or maybe even some parts of Africa, if you don't want to bury people in your house anymore, because people talk, talk about, well, how can I sell the house when it's full of skeletons? Okay, well, one thing we do is we cremate people in some cultures. Not everybody agrees uh, that cremation is the way to go. But if you were to cremate, you could actually have spaces in your house where they're like these little cute indoor courtyards or um, you know, potted plants or just rows where you could actually pour libation. Maybe you could even have urns placed in these spaces for your loved ones. And that way you are keeping your loved one close to you, still practicing that, practicing that African spiritual architectural language, okay? And the last one is local materials. Very important because when we think about the landscape, when we think about what we're doing to the planet or how we're living on the planet these days, supposedly 40% of global warming comes from our profession and the built environment because of the materials that we're using and their impact, right? Africans had figured out long time ago um, for so many reasons the best materials to use. It was just 100% green. So some of the images on the left here, actually all the images on the left, uh, they're clay, they're earth, right? Um, and this contemporary building here on the right, which is actually one of our CPDI designs, that's rammed earth, right? So keeping with materials um, that are organic, low impact, and the one that I really, really love are free, let's use the word affordable, right? Um, you really don't have to pay for materials if you can actually harness uh, that which you have on site. And Africans, um, most people, everybody in the world actually had mastered how to use the materials in their own environment. So here I said, keep in mind as you're talking about your research and coming up with your new prototypes, that you're also using green materials, local materials, or sustainable materials as we say now. So one of the reasons why a lot of contemporary architecture has not been done, one of the reasons in Africa is the stigma attached to local materials. Back during the colonial days, um, those on, on ground would always be told, well, you know, by those coming from Europe who were settling down in you know, creating the new political systems and, and everything that uh, you, in order for you to live next to us, you have to pull down your traditional homes and build uh, with the materials that were being imported. In this case, let's say for Nigeria, you know, colonized by the British, if it were 
uh, Togo or Ivory Coast, I could talk about the French, but in Nigeria, for example, and this is Africa wide, um, Africans were not allowed to use their own local materials. It showed, you know, primitivism and all of that. So these buildings would be pulled down and uh, local people would import cement and foreign building materials, which they can make themselves now, which is quite horrible to use cement in Africa and corrugated iron roofs, you're building an oven, right? Africa equates to the sun, it's hot. And European materials in Africa, um, just, it's a, that's a tough one. But using materials like this that let the house breathe or clay cement, uh, clay laterite keeps, keeps the heat out, right? Um, the stigma attached to those building materials was just much. And so Africans would not use their materials. And of course, in the schools, uh, the curriculums are not Afrocentric. And so um, these were some of the reasons why local materials were not modernized and then standardized, right? So like this image here, um, this is typical resort architecture built by foreign designers in Africa. A lot of times in Kenya, South Africa, areas like that. Foreign designers would come in. They love the materials. It's quite appropriate too, right? You know, green, the warm and fuzziness. They would build great architecture using the materials that Africans were now too embarrassed to use, right? This is the same thatch, raffia, bamboo, clay, done by somebody very local and traditional, right? Beautiful vernacular, but here it's great architecture, right? So part of what we do at CPDI is push that we begin to remove that stigma and standardize these kinds of materials so that um, as, architect as Africa is uh, being redeveloped, right? Some, some people say Africa rising, that it is built in her own image an appropriate, affordable, green, organic image, right? Doing great architecture like what we see here. Um, just a few more examples showing you um, materials. And we talk about landscape, you know, what's available um, in these areas, this thatch and raffia, bamboo. And, and a lot of this is skills that have been mastered, right? For thousands of years. How do you take these materials? and create um, incredible landscapes, right? It's culture, it's heritage preservation, of course, as well, right? Because so much is embedded in this science and in this technology. But taking these materials, um, luckily we have some photographs from the past. So many of these buildings, like I said, were torn down during the colonial era, but you can see great construction techniques were used. Some people said you couldn't go up more than one floor, not true. Here are some images from Cameroon where you can go up several stories using these organic materials, right? So just take them and have architects create, create beautiful architecture, right? Um, again, these are the exact same materials that we're seeing in these photographs um, that unfortunately most people will say, oh, this is savage, this is primitive. This is something my great grandfather lived in. I never want to see this, please tear it down. Uh, but no, take the same materials um, and get it into some design studios and come up with something that um, is green and has you know, just about zero impact. Um, I love these ones from Asia, bamboo. We know the story of bamboo now, same, stronger than steel, uh, beautiful. Um, again, using your own landscape, she's growing her building materials outside of her window. Her whole house is made out of this material, right? So thinking about, you know, treating the earth well, saving money in, in your pocket, and of course, still creating great architecture. Taking these vernacular prototypes and turning them to something that's a little bit more, um, I, I guess we could say comfortable because the images on the right are contemporary takes on the true traditional vernacular that we see on the left, right? If you're gonna pull these down, what can you really afford? Maybe you can afford what we see on the right, right? Um, there's, got, there's, there's power, I can see glass windows, but it's the same language, but in a new way, right? I can see living in any of these units here on the right, I couldn't see myself living in that compound on the left, right? 
Um, so it's a conscious decision. So all of this, again, teaching, I'm having to do this in, in road shows and workshops, giving my students around the world these examples. And luckily, once again, um, architects began to respond from, from Vietnam. These are some of our winners, Nigeria, Ethiopia, Russia, the UK. They came from everywhere, Canada, Greece. Um, we've had four competitions. And let me just show you a few images that came um, from their work. Um, so you see um, what they were able to create. This is one of our winning designs called The Mask by a civil engineer, actually, um, Miss Marina from Russia. She took four West African masks and she drew her inspiration from not only the materials, but the spiritual aspects. You all know Africans never made art for art's sake. If you made a mask, it's because when, you're, when you put it on, you're supposed to be possessed by whatever spirit that, that piece embodied, whether it's an ancestor or a deity, um, fertility, whatever, you become possessed by that and you dance and you remove the mask. It's not for hanging on the wall. So she took these masks and she embedded a lot um, into her building. And, you know, she went as far as um, inspiring each facade um, from one, you know, each facade had inspiration from a unique mask. So it was totally different all on all sides. But again, she used her, her green materials, her timber, her stone, um, different woods. And of course she used um, stone and cement. This was the mask. Another one that came in that was 100% 100, 100 green, three Ethiopian architects, the Gojo. You see what inspired them on the far right? Um, I have artists that are in love with this building, especially those in Germany. Um, this building just said Africa to so many people, um, but it's a technology that's been mastered um, and they use clay brick and raffia to design. The Eton, um, a high rise live work play, you see it superimposed next to your standard um, skyscraper. And these two Yoruba architects use the calabash as their inspiration. It's clad with wood and timber. It embodies all the spiritual fertility, um, beauty, all those elements that are typical in Yoruba culture. Um, from the diaspora, we had Wudza, a student from Tuskegee using um, wood coming up with her prototype for Haiti, you know it's earthquake uh, prone, so um, wood responds quite well. Um, the buildings are much sturdier in earthquake prone zones. Um, she also was inspired with the conch shell, and I really do encourage you all to go to our website, cpdafrica.org, to see all of these submissions. This one I love by architect Umar from Nigeria, pulling on his Jarawa culture, using all the appropriate materials. But what I liked was his taking one prototype and giving it different skins. So in this one, it's Jarwa from Nigeria. We see cow horns, cows are a sign of wealth all around Africa. Um, we see here now with the white facade, we see here, okay, back to Jarwa. Here we see the Ghanaian Kente. So he took the same prototype, but just kept giving it a different identity. So I liked this one a lot and said, let me share. Okay, so as we begin to wrap up on this, on this story of culture and preservation um, from African design philosophies, right? Um, these next couple of slides will tell you, will show you, or well, we'll discuss how we packaged the story into what I call the Art of African Architecture exhibition. So we have about a hundred of these designs that have come in and we present them as art. Well, they're in art boards and we travel them around the world to get people's feedback. How do they feel about um, architecture that has an African aesthetic or an African culture that's um, celebrated? And luckily for us, people would say, oh, this is very beautiful. Um, you know, where can we find these? Where are you selling these? Um, if they had said, no, this is quite primitive, then we would know, okay, yes, it is impossible to translate African identity successfully in the built environment. Um, this is an example of Afrocentric architecture right here in the US. And hopefully many of you know this building, it's a Smithsonian uh, 
African American Culture and Heritage Museum in DC, designed by Phil Freelon, David Ajay, Max Bond, and uh, Ms. Howard. Um, looking at it, you might not tell immediately what the inspiration was until you know. Um, so there's this, this um, statue here on the far, far left. This is a Yoruba statue. Um, that headpiece is called a corona, a very old traditional piece. And then you can see on the bottom here, these women wearing geles. The gele is a traditional um, headpiece that women wear in most parts of West Africa. So you can see where they got the traditional inspiration from the corona on that post, right? And it's a woman's headdress. Today, this is how women wear the same headdress. And then the patterns and the motifs around this building are from the Gullah Geechee quilt work, which we know is a direct translation from Ghanaian kente, right? So this building embodies African aesthetics and culture and spirituality, all of those things, and it's sitting right here in the US. Once again, if you knew, then you would immediately recognize it um, once you see uh, the building. So what I would like to do as I close out is say, and here's a picture of that Corona, that traditional piece up close, is that if we do take the time to create um, spaces um, that are comfortable, right? One of my mentors, Dimas Wunko says, um, you should take the best of both worlds. What makes you comfortable in your community? What can you borrow from outside of your community to create spaces that you're comfortable in, that are affordable to you? that preserve your story, right? Um, if you see somebody walking down the, the road with um, a Kente outfit on, you know they're from Ghana, right? Um, if they have a paisley pattern on, then they may be from India, right? Because paisley patterns come, come from India. So what identifies us? Like we're going through the, build, the community in Chinatown and you see those roof structures, right? And those lanterns, you know immediately China um, or Asia. Um, what could we borrow so that we can preserve heritage and people's stories in their built environment? That's what this is all about. And so I was saying that with this slide, um, if Feel Free Lawn could do that, then surely we could be inspired by this hat that our ancestor, <laughs> now ancestor Cicely Tyson is wearing. You know how African-Americans wear those amazing church hats, right? I thought this was a piece of um, 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 engineering work here, take this, what kind of building could I come up with, you know, from this, right? Just throwing that out, just throwing that out to any designers in the house. Last couple of slides. This is uh, the Royal Museum. It's a, it's a museum in um, Cameroon. Again, spirituality is so strong in the African built environment. Um, this is inspired by the two-headed serpent, which symbolizes strength in that culture. And then the spider, I think a huge tarantula, which shows wisdom. And they use this to make this building. And so I'm saying when you come up to this space, this is an aerial view. To me, it would have been very interesting to also see the landscape designers come up with an environment that really harmonizes with this building, that tells the story, that creates that ambiance. If you want to say it's ambiance, when you look at snakes, how comfortable do you feel in tarantulas? But again, it's like us burying people in the house. It's not spooky if it's normal to you, right? So what kind of landscape can you create around a building uh, like this that begins to prepare you as you approach, um, that begins to tell the story of um, this community? Why a two-headed snake? When you think about snakes in our culture here, it's such a negative thing. It was a snake that deceived I am. Eve and all of that, but not so in this case, right? What's the architecture of community when we know the culture of a people? I do encourage you all to follow us, please engage with us and um, please and uh, keep in touch. And we hope to bring the Art of African Architecture exhibition to you at UGA very soon so that you see more of this story. And I'd love to come and see you all in person and share. Thank you so much.
Let me let me unmute. If you say it loudly, then I might not. Okay, have. I can hear you now. Um, when it comes to contractors, do you reach out to the local communities um, who already have like historical knowledge on how to use those um, local materials correctly? Okay, so you're saying that right now, um, do we actually use local contractors or builders or artisans as they're called in Nigeria? So right now in Nigeria is still on the books. I mean, okay, in Nigeria's case, we've been independent now from England for I think 62 or 63 years, but it's still on our books that is illegal to use local materials, um, green materials. You have to use the materials that we began to imp Im import from England, which we now make a lot on our own cement and things like that. So you don't find people who have the skills to build using local science and technology. They're hard to find, but they're there. If you are able to design something that's Afrocentric that needs their, their help, then you go and you find um, but you do have to pay them a lot because they know now that what service they're providing is uh, they're providing a, a premium service, right? Because if you didn't want that, you would be using the regular cement. Um, but the biggest issue that we have is these materials are not being standardized, right? So we know how to use them when we're doing something really local, something really traditional. But if I want to use that material for, let's say, a four-story home or a skyscraper, um, can these materials stand the strength? We haven't standardized them. We're not modernizing them. People are not going into the labs at school. Well, they're starting to, but it's not um, the norm yet. So when you want to build, you just import building materials from outside. A few people who were in hospitality and in the restaurant business industry, they're able to do something that's a little bit more exotic. Um, and they will use bamboo and raffia, clay bricks, and they'll have their little tiki huts and um, gazebos to give that nostalgic feel. Um, but it's still very specialized. It's not mainstream. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I'll put it in the back. Maybe you can hear me with the regular voice. Um, where do you see kind of the future for you and the work that you do? Um, um, a lot of different people that you work with. Where do you see it going? And especially with the education of people and the awareness that is being brought about thanks to you and how the other people working. Okay, so where do I see it going? So the first thing is for us to start bringing this, this pedagogy to the classroom, just like we're doing now. The fact that I'm here talking with you all, it's just incredible, it's beautiful. This is unheard of, you know, decades ago. Um, so the first thing is to bring this information to the classroom. Bring it to the classroom in Africa first, because um, one of the things that, one of the slides I didn't show is after colonization, right, for most of Africa, uh, 40s, 50s, and 60s, some people got their independent, independence in the 70s. And you're talking about 54 countries. So There's a lot of places. When they got their independence, it was the best, the prime opportunity to say, okay, let's reset. Let's pick back up from where we were when we were last at our highest in our, in our civilizations, evolution of our civilizations. Let's pick up from there and then jump into the future, into the present and then in the future. In other words, uh, let me see, simply create Afrocentric curriculums. Um, but they didn't. What they did was the former colonial um, country created the cur curriculums for the universities, for, for the schools. So now you're in Africa but you're not really learning African content. You're learning the content from France or Germany or America or not America, but um, you know, England. So what they call that is they call that Eurocentric curriculums. So for architecture in the built environment, we're not turning out graduates who are mastering these new languages. 
Instead, they really are copying what they're learning, of course. And it's not working because they're using the wrong materials, um, expensive materials. I can tell you, when you're using European materials to build in Africa, Europe, you're thinking about cold spaces, so you want to know how to keep your houses warm and things like that. You can't imagine how hot it is in a cement building and in countries where there's no permanent electricity. So you're hot. You don't have, you can't always afford a generator and buying into and, and, and diesel to run the generator to keep, to keep the lights on and the air condition on. So you learn to just burn up in the house. Not good. So the first thing is to get the curriculums right. Um, and so I think you're asking, where do I see it going? The first thing is to bring this to the classroom so that we're graduating designers who are masters of this, not just in Africa, but also in, in Europe, right? In America, bring this to the table because here advanced societies, designers here can work with designers there to build amazing architecture. Um, the whole continent of Africa needs to be rebuilt. Who's gonna rebuild it? And they say that in a few years, most uh, of America and Europe will be built up. So they'll only be work for maybe interior designers. But if you wanna practice architecture and landscape and all of that, you can go to Africa. It's an entire continent, right? You saw how large it is. So I think bringing these conversations into all of our classrooms will begin to produce future designers and developers who can master this and begin to reverse some of the damage that we're seeing now, climate change and all of that, it's real, right? Um, people get in, uh, becoming LEED certified. We don't have to be LEED certified if we're naturally only using materials that don't harm the earth, right? So bring, bringing Africa's voice back to the table, um, I think is critical. And once we do that, you all, right? The youth, you all who are gonna graduate, you are gonna create a better world. So that's, I, that's where I see us going with this, empowering you guys, the youth, yeah. So when you talk about um, like working with the, the, the diaspora as well as um, like specifically in Africa, um, do you see their own, are you promoting their own cultural content? texts and their own natural uh, resources and things like that um, in those spaces or, as well? Are you, are you saying we should go back? And, and so in America, in the South, we should see African vernacular. Um, should, should we be seeing that in Haiti, Haiti and uh, the South of America and things like that? What are, you, what, what are your thoughts about that? Okay. So... I think, okay, so remember the map that I showed with all those black lines. I feel that on the continent, you know, like you talk about heritage preservation and tourism, right? Um, I feel when you're in Africa and you're going through the communities, um, you should be able to look out the window and tell that the landscape just changed because you just entered a different um culture, right? You could say nation, but I should be able to drive down the road in Yoruba land and see amazing Yoruba architecture. I should be able to drive down the, the road in Igbo land, Ashanti land. I shouldn't, I feel just because, you know, like I said, everybody is different. Um, I don't think God made a mistake for those who believe in God, didn't make a mistake making everybody unique and different right? Different languages, different food, cuisines, cultures, fashion, music, everything, right? So we should be able to celebrate um, this uniqueness in, in the built environment, in everybody's built environment. Some people argue that a condo in downtown New York or uptown New York should be the exact same as a condo in Shanghai or in Accra or in Abuja. No, why? There's so many reasons why that shouldn't work and it doesn't work. Right, so I feel that the, the built environment should reflect the culture and the identity of the people and the region and their purchasing power, right? Don't force me to buy something that I can't afford. For so many reasons I can't afford it, 
I do know how to build my own house. Don't make me not build my own house for free. Don't force me to pick a $300,000 mortgage when I don't have to. Okay. I feel we should be able to drive through our neighborhoods in New York. If I'm in Compton or on the south side of Atlanta where the African-Americans live, I should be able to drive through and see their culture in the built environment. Let it be a reason why people will want to come to the community and experience something new and different. Stop, take photographs. Wow, can you imagine that? Not just to go and listen to the music or eat the soul food, right? It's great. But for those of us in the built environment, don't we want to have an opportunity to, pre to present something that is also unique and has value? So I think that um, cultural identity should be preserved. Why do we have laws here that certain buildings shouldn't be torn down? And if you wanna buy this building, you can only um, um, renovate it and, and keep the same standards that, it, that were used to design and build it 100, 200 years ago, right? Um, and so when we get contracts, let's say someone from here wants to go get a contract in Nigeria, they should be able to speak a Nigerian architectural language for so many reasons. Um, not saying that you can't design Western buildings in Nigeria or there shouldn't be African buildings in America. No, it, it could work both ways, but definitely give um, each culture the opportunity to speak its language, right? Because that was a thing that kind of got me when I was in school and I didn't really focus on that. When I did an African inspired building, my professor said, um, and he, he was an African-American, all right? That's something I don't often say. He said, Madly is impossible to translate African culture in the built environment. That all we can do is, that, that architecture is for other cultures to do, right? So um, this is a challenge, you know? Can anybody from any culture, whether you're Polish or Igbo, can you speak your your culture's architectural language? You should be able to and preserve it. You know. I hope I answered your question. <laughs> any other? But questions? it's definitely a natural synthesis. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Uh, I was just asking if there were any more questions. Yeah, I got one. Okay. Can she hear me from back here? Yeah, just be loud. Hey, great lecture. That was awesome. Thank um, you. So. Uh, you're based in Illinois. Do you have partnerships with um, different univers universities on the continent, or in which ones? Uh, uh, I, I've connected with uh, Makerere University in Uganda, and, and also uh, Jomo Kenyatta in Kenya, which has uh, landscape architecture and architecture. And I'm wondering, do they already are they already starting to move in this direction? Or are they are they kind of pulling up some of their more more um, like continent? Oh specific, you know, architecture? Okay, so I'm, I'm based in Nigeria. And um, so I've been at this, I don't know, let me say I've been at this about 20 years in Nigeria trying to promote this conversation. So I came in at a time when, um, it, you know, it just was not popular. It just was not popular. Um, a lot has happened in this last 20 years. I have made a lot of progress making noise and pushing this agenda. Um, and luckily for Nigeria, there is a, an architect, uh, Dimas Wonko, who is like the only architect there who is doing this modern African style, right? He's Igbo, so he's channeling his Igbo identity in his projects. He's older now, but his buildings are the only ones that anybody talks about when it comes to architecture in Nigeria. Okay. Um, as you know, Francis Carey just, you may know, Francis Carey just won the Pritzker, which is the top architecture prize. He's from Burkina Faso, but was trained in Germany and went back home and he did some amazing Afrocentric architecture and he's now winning all the awards. Um, and I can say now that a lot of my work is being taught in schools. Um, lectures like this end up on the, on the internet. People take them, they download. Um, people use my journals, my texts as, you know, in their, in their classes. Uh, people quote me all the time now. So it's, it is changing. 
Um, there are a couple of universities in Nigeria that I've, I've um, kind of worked with. University of Lagos. Uh, you know, Lagos is Nigeria's most populated city, 30 million people. Um, Amadou Bello University in the northern part of Nigeria. Um, the University of Nigeria Nsuka in Enugu. Uh, a couple of private universities in Abuja. Uh, Abuja is Nigeria's new capital. It was master planned by a U.S. firm and the architect Kenzo Tange. It's a nice, you know, well laid out city. It's not a, it's not an Afrocentric, <laughs> but it's our new capital. So there are a couple of private schools there that I I um, interact with. Um, so now it's becoming a conversation. And I have a few students who've actually built some Afrocentric architecture. I did a workshop a couple of months ago and took some students to those um, projects to show them examples. Um, can you tell this is African? Can you identify the elements that make it Nigerian? Um, Yoruba, Hausa, Wagi, um, in that case. So things are changing, um, but it's been a, a slow road because um, the profession, you know, it's just a little slow in record. I mean, if you talk about African architecture in those days and people would argue is, is, uh, is Egypt and Africa. When you say the pyramids, because people would talk about the pyramids and then leave the continent. Like there was nothing else for, that they, <laughs> that they had. Um, there was no, nothing else going on in the continent. We hadn't contributed anything else except the pyramids. Again, for those who wanted to acknowledge that the pyramids were in Africa. Right, because they would say Egypt was somewhere else in the Middle East, I, I guess. So um, I think I think that there is progress, and I think in the next few years we're going to see evidence, especially since schools in the U.S. and you know U.S. sets the standards. Once once Afrocentric architecture and planning and landscape and all those things incorporate into the curriculums here, it will change curriculums around the world, because America still sets the pace. Yeah. As a student in America, um, like wanting to focus on Afrocentric um, architecture, what would you suggest um, is the next step for someone someone that is, is, who is a student? Is there, some, is there programs that you know that are doing similar things in America? Um, yeah, what are the next steps as a student and as someone who's coming up in the industry? Wow, Ooh, great question. Okay, so one of the things I didn't mention, <laughs> but you will see when you get to our website. So CPDI Africa actually has an on-demand school and it's um, courses that um, some of us, some of the instructors and professors on the platform um, have created these courses and we've uploaded them so you can go there and download at you know at your own pace. Um, so you have the CPDI Global Studio. There are a couple of schools that are that have this this content in their curriculums. Um, Kent State University in Ohio, that's where Professor David Hughes taught and he launched this theory in his book. Afrocentric Architecture, a Design Primer, that's his book. Um, he led this movement back 40 years ago. And I was, like I said, I attended one class, one lecture, and it put me on this trajectory. So um, definitely looking at looking online for, for schools that have this content. Kent is one. Uh, KSU, Kennesaw State University here in Georgia. Um, I teach there often um, in their art history departments. They have classes on, on African architecture. Um, let's see, all the books. I will say if you go on my website, you will see an amazing bibliography of all the books you, you should buy. Um, I had to kind of teach myself in the beginning because you know where would I go? Um, so books by Inamdi Ele, uh, Susan Denyer, uh, Susan Denyer and Richard Hull wrote books on African architecture, planning, um, landscape back in the seventies. They're, I think they're both British. Susan Denyer, Richard Hull, 
um, Inam DLA, David Hughes, um, Dimas Wonko has books now. Um, Everything by David Ajay, Francis Carey, Miriam Kamara. There are um, Phil Freelon, who is, has passed away now, African American architect. Um, Pierre Gudiabe Atepa, I showed one of his buildings. There are architects who are working in this space, coming up with theories and actually getting contracts to do some of this architecture. So their works and their books. I would say start by you know teaching yourself and then following them, so that um, and okay David Ajay and Leslie Loco, um, both Br British Ghanaians, Reba architects, um, they've moved back to Ghana and started a new institute. I think it should launch maybe next year. They'll be giving, um, offering master's degrees in African architecture. So um, there's a school in South Africa, uh, Witzwatersan, I think it's like the Harvard of Africa, Witzwatersan in Cape Town. Um, I think they have a PhD and the, the, the um, head of department um, is Nigerian, but schooled here in the US in Cincinnati, moved to South Africa. He's the head of that department and he's trying to push um, for this, for that to be the hub for Afrocentric architecture. So that's in Cape Town in South Africa. Um, that's what comes to mind first. If you, if you were taking any notes there, that'll be a good start. But I would definitely say follow CPDI because we try to keep our thumb on the pulse of what's going on. Um, and we definitely are, we've started taking people to Nigeria. Uh, many people go to Ghana and said Ghana is a nice, quiet, calm country. <laughs> Nigeria is a monster, but it's a great, sweet monster. Um, we're inviting students and faculty to come um, through us to take do workshops and do cultural tours of the architecture that is being built there now. Um, and of course, experiencing traditional design as well. So um, I hope that helps, hope that, that starts you on your journey. Anything else? Yes, that's everything. Okay. Thank you so much, Madali. That was really great. Welcome. Loved it. It was nice and refreshing because <laughs> it's something different than what we hear in our normal curriculum. Um, Thank yeah. you. Thank you. A pleasure to always share this. Uh, um, it's what I've been passionate about for so long. It just really is, is to get you know unheard voices to the table get us into the classroom and share because there's so much to learn um, and I think so many answers are held with the old ancient communities there's a lot of wisdom and science and technology trapped in those cultures and so if we can invite them to the table today I think we'll solve a lot of the problems that we have um, today so I like sharing and I really really appreciate the opportunity to share with you today so thank you so much Ashley Thank you. Thank you. I'll be in touch. Thanks so okay much. Okay then. All right. Bye bye everyone. Bye.